thanks for coming out today to see Jackson Crawford. Uh, Dr. Jackson Crawford, sorry, not to leave the doctor off. I'm kidding, he doesn't care. But Dr. Jackson Crawford uh, got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin in Scandinavian Studies. Uh, he got his master's degree in linguistics at the University of Georgia, so uh, he is a dual threat quarterback, as we call them. Um, he can do linguistics, he can do ancient Scandinavian studies, and your, your uh, bachelor's degree, I believe, was in classics yeah. at Texas Tech University. Uh, he currently lives in Colorado, so he's kind of a native of the Southwest. Uh, he has uh, recently, in the past uh, seven or eight years, published a number of books that are translations of uh, ancient Norse literature, such as the Poetic Edda and the Wanderer's Habumal. Um, he wants me to tell you that he's won two Heisman trophies, um, and he won the Golden Boot in soccer, and uh, Triple Crown in the National League as well. I don't know that's true, but you know, he is paying his so. um, But what he really has done, fairly recently, uh, is his, uh, he has started a YouTube channel about five years ago, six, seven now? How long has it been now? It's been a few years. Seven. 2016, right? 2016, seven. yeah. Yeah, uh, the calendar keeps flying, I don't know what's going on. But yeah, about seven years ago, he started a YouTube channel. Um, and he recently passed 250,000 subscribers, uh, so a few more people than are in the room right now. Uh, so uh, today his title is Seeking Runes in Myth and History. Let's welcome Dr. Jackson Crawford. Can you all hear me? So this has been a problem as long as we've known each other. Luke talks a lot louder than I do. Let me make sure I've got this recording for me. All right, how's it going? Thanks so much for the welcome, and uh, thank you very much to Religious Studies at the University of New Mexico for putting this on. I have uh, wanted a good excuse to come to New Mexico again for a long, long time, so this is very welcome. Um, I don't know exactly what you come in here knowing about this, so possibly I'll undershoot, possibly I'll overshoot, but what I want is to be of use to the people in this room. So if I'm starting to bore you, give me the universal symbol of I'm boring you. And yeah, exactly, that kind of, that's good, that's good. I wanted to see what different people's interpretations of that symbol was. Some of them are perhaps not family appropriate. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so let's get started, let's seek some runes and myth and history. Uh, is this working? This is working okay. All right, so to begin with, what am I talking about when I'm talking about runes? Runes are an alphabet, although really they are a family of alphabets. The runes change over time and in different places as they're adapted to different languages. One of the really classic diagnostic features of runic alphabets is that they come in a different alphabet to order completely from any other alphabets that we know of. For whatever reason, instead of the classic Mediterranean order that we see in so many related alphabets, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, ABC, we start <coughs> F, U, F. And so from the distinctive order of the first six letters, we call the runic alphabets Fudarks. I guess that is how they start, much as the Greek alphabet is the alphabet because it starts Alpha, Beta, right? So runes are extremely valuable in the study of the history of the Germanic languages, including English, because our earliest written records of English are what became English, as well as what became German, what became the Scandinavian languages, etc., are in runes. And then today, runes have become very, very famous through uh, cult associations, although those are mostly what the earliest form of the runic alphabet, the elder Fudark, as distinct from the younger Fudark used later in Scandinavia. For anyone who's not familiar with the languages that I'm talking about, uh, here's a simplified family tree that starts with Proto-Indo-European, the ancestor of most languages of Europe and Northern India and places between about 5,000 years ago, leads to Proto-Germanic, the ancestor of the uh, languages that we'll be talking about today, probably 2,500-ish years ago. Most people split Proto-Germanic or split the Germanic subbranch of Indo-European into three families, west, north, and east. East is represented only by Gothic and some very fragmentary remains of things like Vandalic and Ostrogothic and stuff like that that we don't really know very much about. North Germanic is the Scandinavian languages represented in the earliest runic inscriptions 2,000 years ago, and they are as old as 2,000 years ago by Proto-Norse, getting into Old Norse by the Viking Age around 8700, 
and then giving rise to the modern Scandinavian languages of today, your Icelandic, Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, etc. English is part of the West Germanic languages, but I often like to represent the Germanic languages as more of a sunburst instead of in this three branch thing, because English, in fact, shares, especially northern dialects of Old English, share a lot in common with Old Norse uh, that they don't share in common with, say, Old High German. So a lot of these dialects have common features with one another that aren't very well reflected by the uh, trident family tree of Germanic. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you this is because we're going to be talking about Old Germanic languages, which are what are written in the runic alphabets. So when our earliest uh, traces of runes show up in the first century AD, what Germanic languages are spoken where? We have Proto-Norse in Scandinavia. We have Gothic spoken on the Baltic shore. We have Proto-Low, German, Proto-Frisian, and Proto-English, if these were even really different languages at this time, say Proto-North, Northern, West Germanic. And of course, English is going to move to what will become England after the 400s AD. And that is where we get our first traces of uh, written English. Although mostly, since I'm a Scandinavianist, I'm gonna be talking about Scandinavian stuff. Are we good? Am I shooting too low? Is this too basic? I just want to, all right, okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, here is the uh, first inscription I want to look at. This is a classic Boothark inscription. Someone just wants to write out the entire 24-letter alphabet. As I said, it is in an extremely different order from uh, other alphabets. You can see it starts Futhark. By the way, um, if you have seen mostly modern reproductions of runic inscriptions, they never quite duplicate just how haphazard this can be. Many of these letters are backwards, quote unquote, quote unquote, quote unquote. But it's, more, it's, it's probably more realistic to think of it as a picture that can be flipped uh, because they do get flipped a lot. Uh, the order is also not always exactly the same, but they do always begin with the same eight and then they seem to kind of lose steam as far as keeping them consistent <laughs> toward the end. Uh, all the differences tend to come way toward, toward the end. So, but this is my favorite nice, clear picture of a Futhark inscription. Um, one thing that I'll mention uh, right now, and I probably should mention a couple times because it's important, is it's actually pretty hard to date these because they're always, or almost always on rock. So the best evidence that we can get for dating is if they are found in association with a burial and we get some organic remains with that that we can date. Even then, the inscription might predate the burial. It might also postdate the burial. We don't know exactly why someone puts a rock with writing on it on top of somebody's grave. So it can be really, really shaky. Linguists, over time, get kind of a sense of linguistic criteria, right? This is older Proto-Norse. This is younger Proto-Norse, right? But even then, it seems like some older features and some younger features often coexist, right? We're dealing with dialects already at a very early stage. So some of the dating stuff gets pretty circular. I am trying, especially in the last few years, I've been trying to kind of you know, train myself to be really vague about dates <laughs> because I think that it's more responsible than saying, yeah, yeah, you know, this is fourth century, whatever. It's because uh, I have no idea. Uh, I will point out in my long obsession with alphabets, um, Inscriptions like this that just list the whole alphabet also really, really common in ancient Greece and all around the ancient Mediterranean. People liked writing out alphabets. Why? I don't know. Kids do it. Um, I've occasionally seen drunks do it. Um, <laughs> the drunk explanation might have something to do with it. Maybe it's just uh, there's a sense that, hey, I'm showing off, right? I know something you don't. I don't know. So this is about our alphabet rather than Marines, what I'm coming around to a point about runes. The history of the alphabet that we use right now today, every day, is actually pretty complicated. And in fact, it's even more complicated than this fancy chart that I made during a week that I spent struggling to breathe. I was so sick. And the only thing that could distract me was making charts of alphabets. This is why Luke and I get along. <laughs> uh, what I've tried to represent here is if you start with archaic Greek letters and filter those down to the letters that we use today, there's several big bottlenecks. One of which is our alphabet goes through Etruscan mediation. Uh, Etruscans are why our letter C, which the Romans of course use for a K sound, 
is related to the Greek letter for ga, g, because the Etruscans don't distinguish ga and ka, right? So we know there's an Etruscan bottleneck in the transmission of the alphabet to us. There's also a Roman bottleneck. There's some later Roman reforms. The Romans introduce a new letter G that they didn't get from the Etruscans. They introduce Y and Z later, etc. It's a sort of complicated story. The reason I bring this up early is that probably the origin of the runes is a pretty complicated story. And I sometimes get pushback about this in Scandinavian studies, which just sounds so vague, but I guess that's what it is. Um, people saying, well, this is too complicated of a story. What alphabet does it come from? Our alphabet is complicated. Our alphabet is actually probably more complicated. So I just want to have that out there. Runes have some pretty clear affinities with alphabets in the Mediterranean world. Uh, in the bottom left here, I have colored red, letters that look a lot like the Roman equivalents, green, letters that look a lot like Greek or Roman equivalents, uh, and blue, ones that look a lot like Greek equivalents. It's not coming out of nowhere. It's not generated spontaneously from a set of ind independent symbols. It is somehow related to the Phoenician, Greek, Etruscan, Roman alphabets. We don't know exactly what this tree looks like. I'm going to suggest some ideas about that, but it's not coming out of ab nihilo. They also have, and I think this is a really interesting thing about them, some really archaic meta features, and the most interesting one of those is that unlike the Roman alphabet, which by the time that runes are being written is consistently left to right, and is still consistently left to right today, runes are left to right, or right to left, or they're bustropodon, which means a snake between lines, or sometimes they're false bustropodon, which just means they're written kind of a circle. There's no consistency to it in the early centuries. Um, now, sometimes I mention this and I say, so I can't come from the Roman alphabet, and people say, so you're saying it comes from archaic Greek in the 400s BC. No, it's way too long, but bear with me. There's other explanations for this. This is an obsession, and I'm not going to let you out of here before you know my obsession's conclusion. <laughs> um, I don't want to linger on this, but just to point out that it's actually whoever put this alphabet together, whoever adapted it, did a really, really good job. It's basically one letter for one phoneme, one phoneme for one letter. Uh, anyone who studied ancient languages other than Latin and Greek maybe has encountered languages that are much less well adapted uh, to the alphabets they're written in. Um, Gothic is pretty screwy. Um, Old Church Slavic is pretty bad. Um, I give Old Church Slavic a D, Gothic a C. Um, whoever adapted this alphabet, I, uh, A minus. Um, we, so some letters have to do some kind of double duty. So um, the D and the Ith, which is the th 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 sound, right? Like them, there, this, are the same letter. So is G and the fricative version of G, G, B and the V. But that's okay. And then there's one letter that we actually never see in use in writing words. Um, but there is a box of a wall of text for linguists who might wonder what it is. <laughs> it does match with a reconstructed vowel for Proto Germanic. So if it's as old as to have been designed for Proto Germanic, it makes sense. But we actually never see it used to write meaningful words in early inscriptions. I'm getting the magic. Um, and then here is some timeline stuff. Uh, at the top, I have the dominant alphabet in Scandinavia. At the bottom, I have the dominant vernacular language in Scandinavia. As you can see, Elder Futhark, the earliest version of the runic alphabet, matches up pretty well with the time when language we call Proto-Norse is written. There's a huge change around 8700. The language changes massively, and so does the alphabet. We call the alphabet at that point Younger Futhark and the language Old Norse. And then following the introduction of Christianity, Around AD 1000, really convenient year to remember, uh, they switch gradually in some places, swiftly in other places, to the Roman alphabet. So it's interesting to note, I think, a couple dates here. One is that all of our information about Norse myth, or 98% of our information about Norse myth, comes from books written in Iceland in the 1200s. Already Christian, they're already using the Roman alphabet. At that point in Iceland, although not, for example, in Sweden, runes are basically forgotten. They don't use them anymore. Um, and so there's already some mythos to them, right? They're already kind of mystiqued up in a way not unfamiliar from today. Today, a lot of mystical ideas that you'll find, just Google rune. Um, the first 10 results you see, a lot of what they're drawing on are from the very last dates on here. 
spell books that start to get popular in the 1600s AD in Scandinavia, which often present runes as magical, magically valent in one way or another. And in fact, one of the most important manuscripts used to found magical theories today dates from 1860. There are people who have grandparents who were alive in that year, so I think that's a, an interesting thing to note. How are we doing? Okay, I don't see any exasperation hand signals yet. That's good so far. All right, so like I said, Google Rune. Um, you'll see a lot of stuff like this. Pretty much the first stuff that comes up is all modern magical stuff. And I've read a surprising amount of it. I was, I, I was contracted to write a chapter of a book about what the editors, I think slightly ungenerously called pseudo-linguistics. This was about 10 years ago and they wanted me to write the rune chapter and so I signed the contract with Satan and <laughs> Googled rune and bought the first five books I saw. <laughs> and I read them, so I'm sort of familiar with this stuff. One of the uh, most fun parts is probably the modern practice of runic yoga. Um, so what you do is you shape your body into the shape of the letter, and then you say it's sound. So you see I'm making the F right now, so watch this, fa, fe, fi, fo, fu, I just summoned money. As you can see from the fact that I am a professional YouTuber, <laughs> rapidly approaching 40, I did not summon money. <laughs> so it doesn't work to my knowledge. but. Perhaps other people have had different results. Um, if you just look at the previews of these books, though, the stuff is not found in anything, right? So, you know, this is some, this may be written by AI, probably. I don't know. A lot of this stuff could be. Like, runic gods, what the fuck, what are they talking about? Like, I don't even know what that means, right? There's one god in the Eddas who's strongly associated with runes. Does that make him a runic god? I don't really know what runic god means. Um, this one mentions a Norse word, runa, which is not a real word. Um, so I don't know what that's about. But they keep going like this forever. It takes pages on Amazon to get to a book that doesn't present runes as just magic. And I mean just magic. It's kind of amazing. To the point where one of the questions I deal with fairly often when I talk about runes is, are you saying this was used for writing? Yes, it's an alphabet. Um, and I'm not going to search this on YouTube. You can if you want. I am sure it would break my heart, especially if I was logged out. It would probably take 25 pages to get to one of my videos. Um, another thing you can get if you search this on the internet is a lot of weird stuff based on, as far as I can tell, nothing. I kind of love this because most words are misspelled. <laughs> they have basically no calendar. Right, I would, I, I, I don't know, I'd burst out in song if some saga or something actually told me like July 25th, because they never say that. At best you get, it was kind of winter time. <laughs> and King Harold was 50-ish. <laughs> Great, you know, <laughs> you're just sort of trying to triangulate who's 50-ish when someone else is 40-ish and, you know, it's, it's very tough. Um, but this was a uh, top Google image result when I searched for <laughs> This is my least favorite thing I've ever seen other than actual violence committed in front of my face. <laughs> so. All right, so like I said, the medieval mythos, most of what we know about pre-Christian myth is written down in Iceland in the 1200s in this book called the Poetica and the Prosa. I can dig deeper into that if you want, but just rem remind you, the stuff is written down after runes in common use. Um, from linguistic evidence, a lot of the poems in the Poetic Edda, which is kind of an anthology, uh, actually in some ways, an anthology reminds me a little bit of the Old Testament, right? Not everything is from the same place at the same time. There's not like one overwhelming narrative to the whole thing. Um, a lot of those poems on linguistic evidence could well be from before AD 1000. Uh, I can get into how we know that, but think of how you know, Shakespeare can be printed in 2023. It doesn't mean it was written in 2023, right? That the language is not how you talk to the folks at Taco 10, right? Wouldst thou give me 
the special, it's just not how you talk. <laughs> so in the Poetic Edda, we have a poem called Halamol, or if you prefer modern Icelandic pronunciation, as most people who make fun of me on the internet do, Halamol. Um, this is a poem attributed to the god Odin himself. Odin is a god strongly associated with wisdom, and the mythical explanation for the origin of the runes is that Odin sacrificed himself to himself to get them. This is very interesting. Um, one thing I know has often come up when I've presented this in front of new audiences is people pretty quickly say, oh, there's something a little bit like the crucifixion here. Sure. But there's also uh, a lot that you can explain without reference to Christianity. Odin says he's pierced by a spear and that he hung on a wind battered tree. Uh, he is the Lord of the Spear. It's one of his names. And men are sacrificed to him by hanging. In fact, we have a story in a saga called Gatrek Saga about a king who sacrificed to him by hanging and being speared at the same time. So as much as the imagery does resemble the crucifixion, it could well just be completely native. Uh, he is sacrificing himself to himself in the same way men are sacrificed to him. So he says, I know that I hung on a wind battered tree not long nights, pierced by a spear and given to Odin myself to myself. On that tree, his roots grow in a place no one has ever seen. No one gave me food, no one gave me drink. At the end, I peered down, I took the room, screaming, I took them, and then I fell. Do you want to hear it in Old Norse? Or not? Yes. Hold on, I might still have this memorized. <laughs> Or they may the Armandi wait for San of Rotum Ren. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, it's 138 anyway. I had a contest when I was studying at the University of Iceland 15 years ago with another guy to see who could memorize more of them all. And we both did it, but I don't know if I have all of it memorized anymore. But, but that one I, I quote enough. So, um, by the way, this is the entirety of the story. The story is never referenced anywhere else. And these two stanzas are all we've got. Now, this is something that gets really, really, really distorted in the presentation of Norse mythology in the modern world, is if you look up, you know, Google this or go to the big book of Norse myth or something and you say Odin and runes, there will be all kinds of details accreted onto this. But these are the only details that are actually there in Old Norse. So I like to strip things down to what we've got. We also see in the Poetic Edda uh, an understanding of runes as being able to do some magic things. So there is a story of the great hero Sigurdr, who wakes up a Valkyrie, whose name is Sigurdr Ivo or Brynhildr, depending on the version of this you read, who, uh, <laughs> she, it's a, it's, I mean, it's a very metal story. She, uh, you know, Valkyries bring dead men from the battlefield to Odin. So she kills the wrong man. So she is punished by being forced to marry but she says, well, I already swore an oath that even a god can't make me break, that I would only marry the man who knows no fear. So Odin says, fine. He puts her to sleep inside a burning ring of fire. And she says, only a man who knows no fear will ride through the burning ring of fire. He'll go down, down, down. <laughs> and so Sigurdr does. And when he wakes her up, she says, oh, wow, you must know no fear. And he says, yeah, I guess. And she says, well, I'm going to marry you. But first, I'm going to tell you a lot of advice. <laughs> And a lot of her advice is that he needs to learn how to do all this rune magic. Now remember, this is being written down in the 1200s. Uh, there's nothing linguistically here that makes it look much older than that. But clearly, in the 1200s, there is a conception of runes as having magical valence in and of themselves. Right. So uh, she says, for example, the very first one that's there, it might be a little small for y'all. This is just photo, what's the word, screenshot. Um, you should carve victory runes if you want to have victory. Carve some on the hilt of your sword, carve some in the middle of the blade, also some elsewhere on the sword, and name Tyr twice. Tyr is a god, it's also the name of the rune for T. Um, notice she doesn't really say how to do this. She doesn't say, and by the way, the victory runes are this sequence or something like that, right? This is sort of about doing this magic. It's not instructions for doing it. See what I mean? That's a pretty big deal about the way Norse mythology is preserved, too. We have lots of stories about the gods. We don't have any explanations for how to pray to them, how to worship them, how to make sacrifices, that kind of stuff. It's all about. It's not from within the living religious tradition. We also have some stuff in uh, some prose writings about magic that the gods can do that mentions runes. So Odin is the one who is hanging himself and sparing himself in their runes. And we hear in Ynglinga saga, 
which is by the famous, well, famous as far as it goes, Snorri Sturluson, the eighth dwarf. Um, he uh, says that Odin learned how to do all this magic, quote, by means of runes and the songs that are called Galdrar, Galdrar's spoken spells. So Snorri clearly thinks of runes as having that kind of magical valence. We also see some sagas, Saga of Egil Skallagrimsson. If you, I don't know, if you're taking the bus home this evening or something and you trip as you're getting out and you hit your head and you say, I want to devote my life to the study of Norse sagas. <laughs> you could do worse than starting with the Saga of Egil Skallagrimsson. It's a pretty fun story. Uh, Egil, the hero, is a horrible man with a wonderful life. <laughs> uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty fun. So Egil is, um, uh, he's, he's Dr. Rune, MD. So he's visiting this house. This, this farmer named Thorfinn has a sick daughter. And Egil says, well, has anything been tried with regard to her illness? And Thorfinn says, well, runes have been carved. Somebody's carved some runes. So Egil goes over, and under her pillow or mattress or something is a piece of whalebone that someone carved runes on. And it turns out, um, I guess it's not in this exact portion that I quoted, but he reads it, and it is a love spell that some kid carved to try to make this girl fall in love with him. And he spelled something wrong, and so it made her sick instead. <laughs> so notice the care that he takes in this text. Again, this is written in the 1200s, um, with sort of dismissing them, right? He carves the runes off of the bone and then puts the bone into the fire, right? He's sort of negating it somehow, right? It needs to be handled in a particular special way. He even has the sheets from the, the bed that it was on uh, aired. And then he says this semi-famous poem for this kind of stuff, you ought not to carve runes unless you know them well. It happens to many carvers that they make an error. I saw carved on a whale bone, 10 coded letters, it has caused the woman a long illness. You ought not to carve runes unless you know them well, right? There's danger in not doing this right. Right. So again, there's some magical valence in people's notions about this in the 1200s. Those first two lines I have quoted to 500 tattoo artists and never been heeded. <laughs> yes, I know this is a picture of half of my face. I was too lazy to do anything but screenshot part of a video I made. <laughs> but what, I want, what this is, is um, this is late Viking age probably like 1,000s. This is an inscription that is clearly um, magical in intent. So we do have some of this stuff, but it's surprising how late a lot of this is. So this isn't Elder Fruithek, this is Younger Fruithek. This is a language we know as, as Old Norse, and it says, Gore smearer, wound causer, you go away now. Something is found. May Thor bless you, Lord of monsters, giants, anti-gods. A lot of translations for this. It takes three hours to talk about. Gore smearer, wound causer, against vain danger. So it looks like a healing spell, right? Some kind of demon or something, possibly Gore Smearer is the name of the thing. Sometimes names are pretty transparent in Old Norse. Uh, is causing trouble. I guess the person suffering from it needs to be blessed by Thor. And it seems like maybe the being causing the problem is being called a Lord of Monsters as a way of buttering it up. I don't know. Anyway, that's the last screenshot of my half phase. So, there is a mythos in the pre-modern world about runes. It's not actually connected to most of what people present as rune magic today, right? A lot of what you see in terms of what you know, runes are used for magically in the medieval world is writing out spells. It's not that the letter itself seems to have the magic in it, although it seems that the act of writing maybe has magic in it, right? If we need to use if we need to dispel things that are written magically in runes in a particular way. But, um, you know, I, I, I wonder about a lot of these modern presentations of rune magic because they treat, for example, the letter R, which notice looks a lot like an R, as a magic symbol that helps you travel between the worlds. I'm not making that up. That's actually what it's supposed to do according to some of these books. Why doesn't the letter R and the Roman alphabet do that. What's magic about making it a little pointier? Um, and by the way, it's actually not always point. We, we have this notion that runes are really jagged and angular and pointy. It's because most of them are carved. On soft surfaces, they're often 
round. They don't have to be angular, although our Unicode rune fonts are very angular. There's also the question of why did it change? If this was all about magic, why did they get rid of one third of the magic? Because in around 8700, they stopped using this alphabet, the 24 letter alphabet. They cut out eight letters. You can see at the bottom which ones get cut and which ones change meaning and stuff. Uh, why do you get rid of all that? Right. The point, there still is magical in a sense, because you can still use them to do magic stuff, but it's not the letter itself, it's the act of writing. Right? We were talking about this a little bit earlier in your magic class. A lot of ancient and medieval and even modern cultures, there's a lot of useless words, a lot of cultures <laughs> associate the, the word with magic. Right? If I tell Luke to go to hell, there was a time not so long ago in English when that was a dangerous thing to say because I might actually be making it more likely he's going to go to hell. Right? Same idea behind like speak of the devil. Right? So the Norse are very fixated on this. You all, they also have a very complicated notion of you, know, you don't speak ill of a person in their presence because you might cause them ill, that kind of stuff. How much more powerful is that stuff if you write it down? Right? That's really what it seems like the investment of magic is, is in the act of writing down the powerful word. We also don't really know how far back the uh, mythos that we know from the Middle Ages goes to the ancient world. Remember, the Edda is being written down in the 1200s. We are closer to that than those are to Caesar talking about early Germanic speakers in the last century BC. Now, Caesar does mention that they practice lots and divinations. He doesn't say with runes or letters or writing. We, we don't know. Yes, it's possible that he's talking about something done with runes, but if we're being strict with our sources, he doesn't say that. So me, I guess I lied, I, there is a, another picture of me. Um, this is just to show you what some of these rune stones look like, I guess. This is uh, the Yashberry stone in Vastiget uh, on Sweden. Oh no, in uh, Bermond, Sweden. Um, so let me just show you what some of these early inscriptions actually say. It's surprisingly unmagical. Uh, just pick some pretty typical stuff. This is uh, hard to read, but I, ek, and eri law is a word that we see all the time. People writing runes call themselves eri laws, and we don't know what it means because it doesn't survive into Old Norse. Um, it may just mean writer, basically, because they often call themselves this. I'm the eri laws, and I'm the one who writes runes. So somebody says, I, and eri laws, wrote runes. I am named Hravnaz. Incidentally, raven is what that means. So. Uh, Raven's very important in Norse myth. Uh, we also have parts of the inscription. You can see uh, it's actually broken off at the top, so we're missing some of it at the top there. Um, some of these runes, I've kind of indicated this in these blue lines, are written right to left. Some are written left to right on the very same inscription. This goes from left to right to right to left in the same word. You can kind of see in the way I trace it on my notebook there, what they're doing is they're going around the corner of the stone. Right. So the direction of writing is not significant to them. I like that one, though. Uh, here's one written right to left. This is on a shield handle. Nithio Tabitha. Nithio made. Somebody's name, the word made. I like these finds from Ilarud because they support my, uh, you know, it's always sunny in Philadelphia string <laughs> theory that these letters, that a lot of the letters are uh, leftover Greek letters. Um, you can see that the th looks like a phi. Um, most of them, they just have one pocket, but this is two. This looks like a copa, a w. I can come back to some of my string theories later. But I like these. I also like them because they have associated organic remains, so they can be dated. Here's another Ilarut find, another shield handle. Lagurthewa, somebody's name. By the way, their names have meaningful elements, but don't necessarily mean anything together. Like this name means like lake servant. So uh, here's a spear from the Illerup finds, or a lance, I guess it's a different thing. Wagnio probably means killer. Very well could be somebody's name. A lot of their names are like this. <laughs> could be the name of the lance. Right? It's the one that kills. Some of them get pretty decorative. This is the uh, Egia stone from Norway. It's got this cool horse on it. Um, just wanted to draw attention to one interesting part there at the bottom. Uh, the blue is showing you what's in the photo. It's the only photo that I could find. 
of it, uh, other than that big tracing. But that starts a line that says, the sown is not sought by the sun nor cut by the knife. And then there's some damage. Uh, it's been thought that this might represent a pretty early curse, or it may just be a description of the sun itself because the inscription is actually on the face that faces the earth. So it's not publicly visible. That's a weird thing about some runic inscriptions is some of them are hidden like that. And in fact, there's also worn jewelry that has writing on the backside. But typically the message is not particularly enigmatic. Um, for example, there's brooches that just say, I, the air lies, right? This word that might mean something like rune writing. And it just says that on the back of it, right? As if my pen was only painted on the side that you don't see. We don't know what that's about necessarily. Then we have some mysteries, things we just don't know what's going on with. This is a little piece of bone, it's about this big. And it says, ek erilaz, there's that word again that we don't really know what to do with. I, maybe a writer named Salag Salalagaz. And then A, 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 Z, 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 and then M, B, and U, T, 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 T. We don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not a word. I know, I know Old Norse or proto-Norse in this case, can look pretty weird, um, but that's not a word. Um, so obviously there's a lot of room for speculation there. Is this magic? Am I trying to evoke magic by carving particular runes a large number of times? The runes have names. So for example, the letter A is named in proto-Norse Ansus, which means a pagan god. So am I invoking a god, a god, a god, a god, a god, something like that? It's possible. It could be an acrostic, they're actually pretty fond of acrostics. Uh, their poetry is very alliterative, so possibly this is a memory tool to remember some lines of poetry that alliterate on A's and then on, well, I guess it probably wouldn't alliterate on Z's because there's only N words. So it's, it's hard to say. And then we have this word alu at the very end, which often occurs in isolation uh, or sometimes in long strings of someone just writing alu, 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 alu. And, uh, that is the ancestor of a modern Scandinavian word and a modern English word. Can you see what it is? Some of you already know this. Hollow, yeah. This comes to us as a word. This is basically, by the way, English looks no different from this when this is written. Yeah. No, that's way too complicated, way too fancy. It's ale, beer. <laughs> yeah. So are they just writing beer? That maybe, I don't mean this totally jokey, right? I mean, intoxicating beverages are sometimes associated with pretty serious events, right? They always drink at weddings and at funerals, and, and it seems like drinking was even part of religious events. It could be something very serious, but it could still mean beer. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily serious when you find, um, you know, just, a rock where someone has carved alu, 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 because you know, that may just be somebody who's drinking a lot. Maybe That may be a tally. Honestly, I mean, it, as little as, as I can guess what this means, all the A's could stand for alu, and it could, that could be a tally. Right? So we just don't always know what these inscriptions mean. This is, I think, the biggest mysterious one from the very early period. But mostly they're much simpler. Um, this is, until January, this was the oldest inscription I knew of. This is the uh, Vimosa comb, dated to uh, 140 to 160, and it says Harya, uh, that Har part could be the same root as our word hair, in which case this is a agentive noun, it is the hair herb, it's not the comb. Uh, it could also be a person's name, in which case it would come from the root for army, but uh, anyway, I like the idea that it's a comb, this is comb. We definitely have things like swords that say sword and spears that say spear. So this is not just me being silly. There's a lot of that stuff. There's also a rock that just says rock. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> if I make it to old age, <laughs> I'm just gonna, that's what I'm gonna do just with everything. Um, this is now the oldest find we know about. This was announced in January. Um, this is pretty exciting. It's probably the biggest find in my field in my entire lifetime. Some Norwegian scholars announced the discovery of a very large stone that had several inscriptions. This is the, the longest. It's just this name. All carved very lightly. This is very, this is just scratched in. 
but it's also on the bottom side of a rock that's on top of a grave. And the grave is, has organic remains carbon dated to 80, 25 to 120. So that's moving at at least a century ahead of where we knew ruins were before. Um, this looks like it is a name. Uh, it's a hard to read that very last one. This, that could be the X like G, or it could be an N, it's just an angle. But either way, it's a man's name or a woman's name. Uh, by the way, the uh, other finds in this, on this stone, one, this three, I can't remember what the other one was, but one of them is the beginning of Futhark, somebody writing out the alphabet. So they were doing that already pretty early. Uh, they like writing the alphabet. How are we doing? Okay. All right. I don't want to bore y'all. All right, so where do these come from? Um, I'm going to dip out of magic and stuff for a minute because I think that part of what's Part of what's fascinating about this is it's, this is so early, right? You know, the, what is going on in Scandinavia in the first century AD? Not very much that we know of, right? We know no names of anybody there except maybe Ili Baron, <laughs> Ili Baron, right? There's no history about this time. We don't know exactly who they're interacting with outside of, you know, archaeological, linguistic evidence, that kind of thing. The Romans have gotten to Gaul, but they're sure not in Scandinavia. Um, you know, we don't know the cultural context in which this is originating. But somebody is taking an alphabet from somewhere to the south of them, weirdly rearranging it, and starting to write. So where do they come from? I think this is a huge mystery and a fun one, and one that's kind of subverted if we just take them as, you know, magical symbols like people want them to be on the internet today, right? If we just say this means money. Right, we're kind of ignoring that this is actually part of a really complicated story of how people are interacting in the past, even if they have notions about it being magical. So here's a thought experiment about figuring out where these come from. If you look at the capital letters of the Roman alphabet, the ones that the Romans actually used, so there's no J, U, or W there. And then you look at our uh, small letters, we call them lowercase. They're not always very obviously related, right? Lowercase r is not that similar to uppercase r. Lowercase s is real similar to uppercase s, but not all these letters are real similar. If you scrambled the English alphabet, and I did, this is a truly random scramble, I put it in a atmospheric noise thing, um, would you necessarily know that those small letters were from that alphabet? I think it makes it a lot harder when it's not in the same order. So, if we start drawing lines, this is, wow, it's always sunny stuff, right? <laughs> Calm down and have another cup of coffee. Um, we see, all right, it's scrambled all over the place. Only a few letters look really the same, C, O, P. Most of them are a little less complex, or they're about the same complexity, but the lines are moved. Q, right? R, N. And a few are more complex. D is more complex, I gets a dot, G, well, I mean, this G is really complicated, lowercase. So would you recognize that those were connected, especially if they weren't arranged in the same order? I think it's kind of hard to see. So I think that actually the order is part of what's making it harder for us to think about this very clearly. Oh, also some Roman letters have been split, right? So I has become I and J, B has become U, B and W. So in my thought experiment with the shuffled alphabet, I got 9% in the same order. You know, I'd put it back in the number generator and it would get something different, but that's just something random. 30% in the same shape, 57% less complex, or equally complex, 13% more complex, 12% split from what was one letter before. If we assume that runes come from the Roman alphabet, they are actually a worse match. This isn't a huge surprise, but they're a worse match than our lowercase letters, right? 4% of the same order, that means one. <laughs> And it's kind of random. I think it's because the G winds up coming in the same spot. 17% in what we can generously call the same shape. 38% less complex or similar. 25% more complex, 21%. I have no idea what I would do to explain it. Before. But this is the dominant explanation. Most scholars in, who deal with runes, and by the way, just, that means just about all Scandinavians. People in the English-speaking world do not want to touch runes. 
Uh, part of that is because scholars get scared of being associated with things that people think of as magic. Uh, part of that has to do with uh, some World War II legacy, same thing in the German-speaking world, that Nazis were into these and used them in some logos and such. Um, but those who do work on runes today often assume, or postulate, I should say, more generously, a Roman origin, and a lot of that has to do with just place and time. What is a prestigious alphabet that a person speaking a Germanic language in, and of course, we used to think later, but now as early as, or as late as, something like 8025 is now a, a, a last date, right? I don't think it's irresponsible to think that that's not the very first thing written down, right? There could be a century, maybe even two centuries of tradition before that. They're encountering writing around when the BCs become the 80s. What's a prestigious alphabet at the time? The Roman alphabet. And sure, the Romans are encountering Germanic speakers in Gaul in the last century BC, right? Caesar talks about them. So there's a good place and time uh, explanation. I have issues with it mostly because of those meta features, right? If you're borrowing the Roman alphabet, well, actually, I mean, my big contrafactual is why don't you just borrow the Roman alphabet? If the Roman alphabet is so prestigious, why don't you just borrow that? Just write with that. Everybody else does around the Mediterranean at about this time if they're learning to write from the Romans. But also, the Romans write consistently left to right. Runes have this very archaic feature that you see all the time in the ancient Mediterranean with Phoenician and Greek and even really, really early Roman writing. Again, left, right, right, left, or Vistrapodon. That's a meta feature that would be hard to pick up from just learning to write from Romans. The order is weird, obviously, that's true of any alphabet. But I also think a critical meta feature is runes don't distinguish U and Wa, right? The Roman alphabet originally writes both of those as a B. And they don't distinguish E and Y. The Roman alphabet originally writes both of those as an I. So I've been skeptical of a Roman origin for a long time. In the last couple of years, Celtic scholars uh, have been working on a lot of local scripts for Celtic languages in the Alps. Right, Celtic used to be spoken all over Europe and into Asia Minor, right? It's not just Britain. Sometimes you say Celtic and people think Stonehenge, but that's, that's not even Celtic, right? The, the Celts used to be very widespread. So there were Celtic speakers in the Alps. Uh, in particular, there's this language around Milan called Lepontic that lasts until the first century AD. They use an adaptation of an archaic Greek alphabet that they write left-right or right-left or Vistrophodon well into the last century BC, first century AD. We know there's Germanic language speakers who are also getting down into the Alps at this time. We have Germanic names occasionally written by Celtic or Roman uh, authors at that, that time talking about activities in the Alps. And pretty cl critically for my weird theory about this, uh, these Celtic alphabets pass on archaic Greek letters that you don't see in the classical Greek alphabet anymore, like san, copa, um, digamma, right? These weird letters that you don't see in fraternity row. So one of those letters is used in Lepontic. This was recently demonstrated by a Celticist. Um, this is san, an old Greek letter for an S, so it's always been transcribed to S, but he realized that it actually is an N, right? The then there, this sound. Uh, this is from a milestone with the name of Milan written in this alphabet. It's Mediolano with that bat looking uh, D letter. That's the same bat looking D letter that writes D or E in runes. There's no other alphabet that has a letter that looks anything like that for a sound or anything like that. I think that's a really crucial connection, a very plausible point for a Germanic language speaker to learn to write. We also know they're talking to Celts. They have a lot of words they borrow from Celts at about this time, including uh, they learn how to work iron and what iron is from Celts. So our word iron ultimately comes from Celtic. Um, and not to put too fine a point on it, the word rune is probably from Celtic. It means secret in Celtic. If you've ever heard that Irish earworm song, Shula Rune, actually means like, run my love, because you call your love your secret one. And Irish is kind of romantic, right? Uh, those those, uh, those uh, 20th century songwriters. Um, so they're not using it for writing, but the word does seem to come from there. 
So if you do the same thing I did with the Roman alphabet and runes, or the Roman alphabet, capital letters and small letters, you get a really, I think, satisfactory looking explanation if you look at the Laponic alphabet and runes. None of them are in the same order, but of course that's true anyway. 54% in the same shape, 29% less complex or equally complex. Also, if I'm right that these are the earliest shapes of these letters, then it's even more similar. And really just one letter that it's hard to explain with anything but the Roman alphabet, which is the F. All right, anyway, this is getting too dinguistic. Um, so I will try to skip along um, before I look too much like I'm making the string chart. So you can do the same thing, basically, with the runes as you do for the Roman alphabet, and it is no more complicated, except for the fact that for whatever reason, it's in a completely batty order. <laughs> right? I still don't know what to do with that. Uh, we could talk about that a little bit if you want. There's weird speculations about it. So it's not a huge mystery as I kind of come to the end of these slides, and hopefully you can answer some questions for you all about specific letter shapes. My very handwriting barely looks like what it would look like if I typed. Right? This is just a random thing that I had sitting on the desk. It's like, okay, this is what it looks like when I write it. That's what it looks like typed. Pretty different. Especially the weird cursive-ish J or C that I do. Right? People make these weird stylistic flourishes. People have been doing that for thousands of years. So specific letter shapes, there's weird, basically stylistic flourishes. I don't think that's that dispositive about where an alphabet comes from. I think meta features are a bigger deal. But of course, the biggest meta feature that's insanely hard to figure out is why it's ordered this way. That's what it's, if you take the archaic Greek letters and then you take the earliest Greek letters and, and draw a chart, nothing is in the same place, except they both end with O. The O looks like omega, which is kind of cool. And I don't think it's a coincidence, but it may be a coincidence that it's at the end. So why is this, right? And I thought, and you'll know where the speculation came from, Lou, if an alphabet is a very successful franchise, what kind of copy is this? Is it, <laughs> is that we tried to do the exact same thing and cast off as serious? Like we really, really meant to do the exact same thing beat for beat and somehow screwed it up? <laughs> or are we actually kind of trying to do something different, right? Is it deliberate? It's almost so random that I wonder if it is deliberate because I feel like if you were just screwing it up, you wouldn't screw it up that bad, right? I feel like if you're trying to copy the order, you would at least get A, B, C, right? You'd get foggier toward the end, right? But why is it just completely jumbled throughout the whole thing? I don't know. Is it the space balls of alphabets? Or is it the force of Wiccans of alphabets? <laughs> this is the question I posed to you today in Upper Wiccan, New Mexico. So why care about it? Again, this is our earliest sources for so many languages, including the language I'm talking to you in right now. And I don't care what people think about magic today. That's fine. That's other people's business. But we are projecting onto the past, and we're losing this much bigger, weirder mystery of where this even came from. And I think we're also sometimes projecting too much of our 19th, 20th, 21st century ideas about magic onto people who certainly believe in magic, but might have thought of magic very, very differently from how anybody thinks about magic now. I think we've seen just how weird magic was in the ancient Mediterranean world. I'm sure it's no less weird at the same time in Northern Europe. And why am I trying to reach the public about this? Why do I now make a living on YouTube talking about this? It's still the weirdest thing in the world to say. It's because academics don't talk to the public about this. They say, oh, this stuff is associated with magic. I'm not gonna get mixed up with that. Yeah, okay, so the people talking to the public are the ones with an agenda, right? That may be as relatively harmless as I wanna tell you that I'm a magical guru who can teach you love spells. <laughs> or it can be pretty dangerous. There are people who sell some pretty comprehensive, pretty <laughs> socially difficult <laughs> ideologies associated with runes. So I keep trying to talk about it. I keep trying to you know, encourage people to have an interest in it, and, but really look at what's actually there in the ancient sources, what's actually there in the medieval sources, and not project our modern ideas so much. That's the end of the slides. If you have questions, remarks, criticisms, complaints, manifestos, 
<laughs> I've got manifest. I will take them at this time.